John, can you hear me okay? okay? Can you hear me, Michael? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Like your background? Yeah, I'm, I, I'm, honestly, I normally have a different background, but uh, we're going with it today since it's up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, you got your, you got your little cafe background there. I do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, perfect. So uh, give me a second as I just get a. Me to what's that? I said, is that background good for you? Do you want me to oh, show? Yeah. No, I love it. I love it. Uh, just give me a second. We're going to stream uh, to Facebook here and then we'll get started. Um, all right. Where we get a lot of most of our views uh, actually is from the replays or the live streams. And um, perfect. All right. Perfect. All right. Give me one second. Getting that finalized, and then we should be good. Sounds good. All right, we're streaming. We're on. Uh, welcome back, everybody, to the, another episode, actually the 22nd episode of Luxury Lunch and Learn. I'm excited for today's guest uh, from the, you know, us, us Americans sometimes refer to Canada as the Great White North, but that's not a fair uh, assessment as I've been up to the Toronto, Mississauga uh, several times. It's a beautiful country. It's, it's gorgeous. And, and, and I have to admit, many Americans are terrible with Canadian geography. So forgive us for that. Uh, but I have a uh, Sean Morrison, who's the uh, president of the Ontario Real Estate Association on with us today. So Sean, welcome. Thank you very much, Michael. And you're you're not that far off. I mean, two weeks ago we did have snow in uh, in my area, so and now it's uh, it's plus twenty eight. So, uh, you know, we can have a great white north anytime. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it's beautiful up there. And actually, the last time I saw you was end of February at the uh, Realty Twenty Twenty Conference, and uh, you you were sworn in as the the president of of the Ontario Real Estate so Association then. And um, so, tell everybody a little bit about uh, first off. Uh, you're also an agent with Cobalt Banker. So tell everybody a little bit about your background and a little bit about your role within uh, the Ontario Real Estate Association. And then we'll kind of go into, uh, you know, the, today's episode, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've been a realtor for uh, just under 15 years now, um, uh, primarily out of uh, Burlington, for those of those uh, that don't know uh, the geography around here. So I'm, I'm positioned almost right uh, directly in between Toronto and Niagara Falls. Uh, in Ontario. So uh, very, very different regions. I go from a wine region on one side to uh, the, the largest city in Canada on the other. So uh, very much a, a mixed urban and rural environment, which brings uh, a pretty unique market. Uh, as for um, my position with the Ontario Real Estate Association, uh, we service our 80,000 members across the province. And uh, we are the uh, provincial regulator. So well, you would have uh, your state regulators. That would be like our provincial regulators. Uh, so uh, we govern the entire province of Ontario, which is about uh, four times the size of Texas. So if you get an idea of, uh, of geography for the, uh, the U.S. participants, it's, yeah. it's quite a vast space. And we go uh, everywhere from uh, rural mining communities in the north all the way to, uh, like I said, Canada's largest city in the, in the south. So it's a, it's a very unique and, and different landscape to... Uh, to work within. So uh, 
it's been it's been really good. We're we're primarily uh, there for our advocacy and uh, our college training at the moment, uh, but we're moving uh, moving into uh, different fields at Aria as things progress, especially uh, things like COVID nineteen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you know, in the states here, we have you know real estate associations, right? So uh, about a month ago, I had Teresa Kenny, who's the CEO of the Miami Association of Realtors, which is the second largest real estate board behind Toronto's. Um, so Toronto's uh, underneath the Aurea umbrella, is that correct? Yeah. So um, Toronto would be our municipal. Uh, so that is roughly around 55,000 members. We have uh, Aria, which has around 80 to 81,000 members uh, currently. And then uh, we have our Canadian Real Estate Association, which is like NAR, uh, that overreaches uh, the entire country. Okay. Very good. Very good. Uh, so uh, we were talking uh, as we were preparing for this. And so the Realty 2020 conference was end of February. It was in Niagara Falls. First time ever there. It was beautiful. The hotel overlooked the falls and uh, it was just a great experience. But uh, at the time, of course, you know, COVID-19 hadn't shut down Canada, hadn't shut down the states. Uh, talk to us a little bit about, uh, give some context of, of dates, if you will, with uh, with the Canadian market, specifically Ontario, because that's what you're more familiar with. But, you know, in the United States, uh, you know, Friday the 13th of March was our kids' last day of school in the Chicagoland market. And then Sunday, uh, I believe it was the 15th, is when President Trump, you know, had, you know the pandemic and basically, you know, really uh, clamped things down to give us some context of the states. And I'd love to hear a little bit about uh, Canadians, uh, Canada's timing. Yeah, and again, it was it was more province by province. I mean, I'll give you the the timing for Ontario, and it's it's very similar across the country. So, uh, as you were saying, we were down uh, February twenty fifth is when I took over as president of Aria uh, in Niagara Falls at the Reality Conference. From there, uh, moving forward, I went uh, to actually to Tennessee to a Berkshire Hathaway event, um, and that was when COVID had really started to kind of rear its head. Uh, I actually ended up coming back a day early. I landed back in Canada on March twelfth. And uh, we were locked down at the end of the month, uh, end of March in Ontario. And, and we've been under a state of emergency ever since. Uh, things uh, progressed pretty severely through uh, March and April. Towards the end of April and early May, uh, we started to see um, a little bit of a, a waning in the numbers from our social distancing and physical distancing protocols. And uh, now we're starting into phase one in the province of reopening, which is uh, some of the you know, street front retail can open some parks have opened and, and we're starting to gauge the response to that as we move forward in, in the plan. Our province has put out a, uh, a three phase plan and each phase okay. has individual stages within it. So we're in phase two, stage one at the moment. And uh, we have to move all the way through to the end of stage three to be fully reopened. So we're just starting the, uh, the reopening process here now. Okay, you know, very similar here in the States, um, you know, pretty much the governors of each state state determine the reopening process um, based in the Chicagoland market and real estate was deemed essential. So we have been able to show homes and, and, you know, homes are, you know, we listed two homes yesterday, homes are selling, homes are closing. Um, talk to me a little bit about uh, real estate. Is, is, is that by province or talk to me about, is it essential? And, and what are you seeing as far as, you know, real estate? When, when did, I guess you guys hit the Valley and, and talk to me about the V-curve. Are you guys going up as far as activity and showings and that sort of thing? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, it's uh, province by province as far as uh, what the um, provincial governments decided to do with real estate. Okay. Um, the Ontario Real Estate Association lobbied really hard to ensure that real estate remained an essential service and, uh, and we were named an essential service. Now, there was a ban uh, at our request on open housing. Uh, so not to allow open houses, obviously having, you know, 30, 40, 50 people into a property um, you know, during COVID-19 was not a good idea. Uh, we requested our members move more to a digital platform for showings. Um, you know, we set out a, a, a group of guidelines to say, you know, during the state of emergency, try and transact essential business only, although we are, um, you know, basically we're named an essential service and can continue to move forward. Let's try and do uh, as little face-to-face -face as possible to help flatten this curve and move forward together so we can all get back to work quicker. What we were seeing as far as statistics go is that, uh, you know, in different parts of the province, and as I said before, our, our province is very vast and different in its landscape, um, you know, we, we saw anywhere from a 55% drop to an 80% drop in the number of uh, showing, tran uh, showing transactions uh, going yeah. on as well as uh, sales. 
And then um, the, the good part about it is our values seem to have held. So uh, we're, we're seeing kind of across the, the province about a 1.5% drop uh, overall in value. So well, the number of showings went down, uh, the market value of homes remained high. And that, that's due primarily to a, a long-standing supply and demand issue we have in the province. Uh, we have way more demand than, than we have supply. So that, that works into our advantage even through COVID-19. Um, now what we're seeing is, is like you said, that U-shape. Mm -hmm. So uh, showings are starting to return. Consumer confidence is coming back to the market. And we're starting to see more and more consumers wanting to transact in real estate. And that's where we are in, in the phase one uh, of, the, of the process of, of moving forward back to uh, whatever the new normal of business is going to be. Okay. So a couple points I want to circle back to. Some really good information you shared there, Sean. So, so uh, you had mentioned open houses, you know, you know, 40 or 50 people in open houses. You guys, uh, when I say, you know, your real estate market has been strong. It's been a seller's market for a while because there's limited supply. So when a nice property comes on the market, whether it be vertical condo or single family home, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of activity. And it, it, it's 40 or 50 people through an open house common there. Is that the norm or is, is that an exception? Uh, through my market, uh, that would be, you know, probably pretty normal to, to see. Um, certainly in uh, the city of Toronto, open housing is very popular. It's a very dense uh, city as well. So, um, you know, much like uh, New York City, for instance, you're yeah. going to get a lot, of, uh, a lot of people looking at that. In parts of the north, not so much. Um, you know, I would say, you know, a successful open houses in some parts of our, our province might be seven to ten people. Yeah. So, it's, it's, again, it's a very yeah. vast uh, landscape. So, uh, I'm, I'm kind of quoting some statistics from uh, the GTHA, which is my area. Okay. All right, that, that's helpful because give you some idea, the Chicagoland market for the most part has been, you know, a balanced market, if anything, a buyer's market, especially in the upper end prices, the higher end prices. And so, you know, seven people through an open house would be a great open house. So 40 or 50 would be unheard of. Uh, again, I know, I, you know, a lot of agents across the country, different parts of the world, and they have, you know, very successful numbers as as you guys do as well. So uh, touching on a couple points you brought up, you said, you know, at, at, at the Valley, if you will, showings were down 50 to 80%, which is very similar to uh, many markets here. Uh, showing time, which is an app that real estate agents use, to sometimes schedule showings instead of contacting the agent, they'll go through the app. They release data for the states that they represent in, in the United States. And for example, Illinois um, on the 26th of March was, was the Valley. Uh, showings were down uh, about 50% at that point. Now they're around, down about 10% uh, from a year ago at this time. But, you know, some of my friends in New York and, and Pennsylvania, you know, they were down 90% just because they had stringent uh, more rules as far as essential versus non-essential. So it uh, gives everybody a little bit of context there. Uh, talk to me a little bit about, you know, so, so you guys have had a lot of international and yet, and I'm putting you on the spot, so don't worry if you don't know statistics, but you guys have had a lot of international buyers, uh, maybe towards larger cities, right? So Vancouver, right. Toronto, um, you've had, has, has that really, you know, slowed down because of COVID-19 or uh, is it, has it been affected at all? Well, I don't have the uh, an actual statistic based on that, but what uh, what I do know is, I mean, we were locked down from a, an essential uh, travel ban uh, here in the province. So, you know, anybody coming in to buy property certainly is not coming in anymore. Uh, as you know, our border is still closed uh, with the U.S. as well, and and some of our feeder markets come out of the the U.S. as well because the majority of the population in Canada lives within a hundred miles of the U.S. border. So uh, that's a very uh, Interesting. I've never heard that statistic right there. Yeah. So if you, if you look across the top of Canada, you'll see where all of our major cities are usually within a hundred miles of the, uh, of the uh, U S border. Um, so there's a lot of uh, cross traffic for us uh, coming in, you know, whether that be cottage uh, facilities or second homes because they work in both, uh, both countries. Uh, so we do see a lot of that out uh, more towards BC. They lean very heavily into the Asian markets. So, um, you know, the, uh, the China, um, Japan, Hong Kong, those all feed into the, uh, into the Vancouver market as well. So the, obviously that's been stunted by COVID-19 mm -hmm. as well. Um, so we still do see a high degree of foreign interest in owning property in Canada, but uh, it's certainly been slowed by COVID-19. And, and, and talk to me a little bit about, uh, so that was feeder markets. You mentioned feeder markets for those of you, because we have some 
most are in the real estate industry that watch this, that watch the replays where we're streaming these, uh, but feeder markets or migration markets. So people, you know, major cities uh, where you're seeing people buy from or major cities you're seeing Canadians in the Ontario market move to, um, whether it be vacation properties, snowbirds, talk to me a little bit about, uh, can you name some of the, from your province, uh, from, from the Ontario region, where some of those major cities where you see people moving to? So we, we get a lot of, um, well, we get a lot of tech companies uh, starting up in, in the Toronto region as well. Uh, you know, we have Google here, Amazon's moving in, um, you know, a bunch of different companies like that. So we, get, we do get a lot out of the California market. Uh, we find a lot of our vacation or second home properties uh, up in our, our uh, beautiful north in Muskoka and Lake Country uh, are coming out of uh, places like New York City, Germany, um, and parts of Spain. So uh, there, there's quite a, quite a vast uh, feeder market for us. Uh, the majority of the, the cross-border work is coming out of uh, job transfers. So companies okay. out of the U.S. that have uh, transfers here. And then from our side, it seems to be more vacationers heading down to Arizona, Florida, uh, those types of uh, areas for the better weather in the winter. So we, we yeah. move back and forth that way. Okay, and, that, and that's what I figured, but uh, thanks for that insight. Again, just a reminder, anybody that's watching this live stream or if you're on the Zoom, if you have a question for myself or Sean, whether it be you know, luxury related or you know, Canada market related, please type it in. And at the end, we'll ask Sean for his information. So if anybody types in a, a question after the live stream, uh, we'll make sure we get that over to him as well as if you ask a question for us. So again, please like, please share. We are giving away a uh, free ticket to the Inman. Uh, Inman's doing their Connect uh, Live June 2nd through the 4th. We're gonna be giving away, we have two other tickets. We're gonna be giving those away over the next couple of days. And all you have to do is ask a question of Sean, ask a question of me, or share this uh, on your Facebook page and you'll automatically be enrolled it's a $100 ticket, it's free. Inman, if you haven't checked it out, you can go to inman.com. It's uh, good stuff there. So, uh, yeah, all right, let's get back to, uh, what's that? I said it's gonna be a great event. Yeah. Uh, that, man, get connect, yeah. Pow powerful lineup, powerful lineup for sure. Talk to me a little bit about uh, what are maybe some of your, your agents doing to adapt, you know, if you, you know, pre-COVID-19 over the last year, I would say, one of the big buzzwords in our industry was disruption or disruptor, you know, disruption tech. Um, now it's pivot, shift, grit. You know, what are some of your your top agents uh, that you're seeing uh, within, um, oh, is it Aurea, right? Yeah, Aurea, yeah. Yeah, Aurea, excuse me. Yeah. Uh, what are some of the top agents in Aurea doing or within Cold Bank or other brands that you're seeing as far as during this unprecedented time? Well, I think you, you hit the nail on the head when you said pivot. Um, realtors are really good at adapting over time. I mean, we do that in our job every single day, you know, as we're going through a negotiation or, uh, you know, working on our paperwork, we're always having to adapt day by day. So what we saw here uh, really early and what Aria tried to do to assist our, our members was help them in that, that pivot to uh, digital marketing, help that in, them into that pivot of using the digital tools available to them uh, over time. So, you know, some of the things that they did early was switching to virtual open houses from from uh, regular open houses, mm -hmm. virtual staging, uh, some companies are using, because yeah. we don't want to be moving things in and out of houses during COVID-19. Uh, a few years ago, uh, Rhea lobbied to have electronic signatures uh, for use in, um, in uh, real estate transactions. Mm -hmm. And a lot of members hadn't adapted it to date, but they were forced to adapt it uh, during uh, COVID-19, and they made that pivot very well. We're seeing a variety of different ways of doing virtual showings, a really big uptick in VR, so that people can go in and really look around a house virtually before they go into the actual physical property and have a physical showing. So I think, I think that we were pretty quick to adapt that technology early and to come up with some creative solutions for showing mechanisms without having to go into the property itself. Mm -hmm. yeah, good point, good point. And, um, where are you guys at as far as, and maybe you mentioned this, uh, so it might be re repeat for you, but where are you at overall? I know it varies, but general rule of thumb, as far as um, last year, you know, at this time compared to where you're at now, as far as showings or number of listings, a number of transactions, are, are, are you getting closer? I mean, are you on, on the way up, so to speak? 
Yeah, I'd say we're, we're almost back to where we were uh, early January this, this time of year. So we start off our market, depending on weather, of course, because, uh, you know, people don't like to go and show a property of minus 30. Sure. But um, <laughs> uh, as, as we're looking at it across Ontario, what we're seeing is that uh, in early January, you know, we had a, a pretty strong showing. We were on track uh, going through until March, you know, around 12th, 13th when COVID, sh uh, COVID showed up. Um, you know, that we were on track for a better year than 2019, uh, dramatically better uh, in the way of showings. And then it really dropped off a cliff right around that, uh, that time frame. And we're seeing now that kind of U-shape happen. And, uh, and we're returning almost to where we were in January. I would say probably by end of month, we'd be back up to our January numbers. Still okay. a little slower for our spring market. But I think our spring and fall markets are going to kind of merge this year is what, what we're starting to see. Because uh, as I said earlier, that uh, consumer confidence is coming back. Mm -hmm. So as that returns, there's more and more demand into the marketplace. And I think that's going to carry us through summer, where normally July, August might be slower months for us. I think it's going to carry straight through into the fall. You know, July and August are pretty slow months in the Chicagoland market as well. So, you know, we're hoping that, you know, everything is not just condensed. You know, the prime markets here, the four primary markets in Chicago are, are, are March, April, May, and June. And we're hoping those four months just kind of get pushed back a little bit versus, you know, heck, June is, is the market. We're hoping that's the case. Of course, time will tell, but we have great interest rates right now. And we're definitely seeing a, a bump in activity here. Uh, are, based on what you're seeing with COVID-19 and, and a lot of these cities being on lockdown, I got to imagine Toronto's pretty strict with their um, restaurants and, and social distancing, um, maybe more so than something rural where there's not you know, a neighbor real close to you. Um, do you in your opinion, do you see uh, a higher uh, demand for estate type properties, properties with, you know, lifestyle amenities, i.e. pool and outdoor sport court and privacy. Uh, do, do you feel, you know, this pandemic, uh, as tragic as it is, do you think it might help some of those unique high-end properties where um, traditionally they take a little bit longer to sell in most markets? Well, it's funny, actually, we're doing uh, consumer research studies right now uh, to find out what the effects of COVID-19 are in, uh, in Ontario on the Ontario consumer. Um, what I'm what I'm seeing in my own personal business and what I'm hearing from other agents that I talk to on a regular basis is that we are seeing just that. We're seeing a lot of interest coming out of Toronto where they might be looking to sell their three or four million dollar condo in favor of having a, more of a backyard or, or some additional green space after this. So when you've uh, you've been locked up in uh, even if it's a, a big condo, even if we're talking, you know, 5000 square feet you know, uh, as a one floor living, you're, you're still locked up in there without a lot of outdoor space, maybe only a small terrace or a couple of balconies. So, um, you know, taking that money, getting out of that market and maybe moving into something more ground source, uh, like you say, maybe an estate property or, or somewhere where they have a, a larger backyard to, uh, to escape to after this. Mm -hmm. uh, we're yeah. certainly seeing a lot more up in our, uh, as a secondary home uh, as well, we're starting to see our cottage country market really go, uh, really go off, uh, due to COVID-19 as well, now that they can return and, and shop up there, uh, now that we're starting to reopen, we're starting to see a lot of interest in having a secondary home to go to. So something on a lake or uh, something that has, like you said, a country or an estate property where they can get out of the city in, in a scenario like this, or maybe they've uh, realized that, uh, you know, that is a really important part of life is to get away to something like that. And maybe they're not going to travel as much internationally. So we're starting to see them travel within Canada and, and start to move towards the cottage markets. Oh, interesting. Yeah, the the, uh, the Lafitos, we're doing a road trip as a family, the Griswolds, if you will. We're, we're doing the old Yellowstone Park and West Coast and, and all that. So uh, just because, you know, no, no flying, uh, that sort of thing. So uh, good perspective. I, I appreciate that. H how do you, um, I know, uh, try to put your Cobalt Banker hat to the side, but when I say you, as your uh, position as president um, of Orea, how do you guys define luxury? Um, if you were to, if somebody were to ask you, um, what's the first thing um, you would, how would you answer that out of curiosity? Well, that's a hard one because I don't think we really distinguish from the provincial association standpoint what's luxury and what's not. Um, you know, my initial thought to that would be, you know, an atypical property, something that is not in the average uh, home. So, you know, I, I always go to that high net worth individual, um, you know, that affluent individual. And, and something that's, you know, definitely unique. I know in my area, um, you know, as I said before, we're, we're quite close to uh, a really nice wine region in Ontario, Niagara. 
And uh, there's a lot of call for private vineyards, for instance, in the luxury market. Uh, we also, uh, where I am in Burlington, uh, we have a large equestrian community. So we have whole equestrian communities where, you know, essentially uh, horses have the right of way uh, over, over the cars in the neighborhoods. So, sure. you know, large paddock lands, uh, you know, looking for riding barns, those kinds of things. So I would say, you know, from, from a luxury standpoint, those are things that you, you need to consider in my market is, you know, what is that high net worth individual looking for? Are they looking for, you know, an outdoor uh, barn space where they can store, you know, 30 luxury cars? Um, you know, those types of things. So when, when I think luxury, that's where, where I come along is, is thinking of unique properties or unique opportunities in the market for that high net worth individual. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because, you know, many brands define luxury differently. A coal banker's definition might be different than Keller Williams, which is different than an ind independent. And um, that's, that's, I was just curious um, from your standpoint. So thanks. Thanks for that. You know, for our designation, we define it as three times the average sale price for that given market. So if the given market's average sale price is 100, you know, luxury would be 300 and above. So many brands define luxury in the States as a million dollars and above, but for some of those rural areas, a million dollars, it's hard to find a million dollar home. And some of those downtown areas, you know, you, you don't get much for a million. So uh, I thought I'd ask. Yeah. yeah, good information. Um, tell me a little bit more about um, if somebody wants to find out more about Canadian real estate or uh, uh, ARIA or um, just the, the Toronto market. Um, you know, again, Toronto being you know the largest real estate board in, in North America, probably in the world, right? I mean, it's got to be, right? Miami second. I can't imagine there's no formal real estate boards as large, you know, in Europe and other. So it's, it's got to be the largest in the world. It's got to be one of them. I don't know if California would be larger uh, or not, but I know uh, certainly it's a it's a sizable board. Yeah, uh, well, city from a city perspective, I would imagine it probably is uh, roughly about fifty five thousand members. Okay, yes, yeah. yeah, so they they got to be the largest because Miami's second in in, in North America at least. Um, so interesting um, for people that want to find out more information um, about Aria. Uh, what's a good place to start? Well, definitely our, our ARIA.com website. And if they're uh, specifically interested in, um, you know, what we've been doing throughout COVID-19, uh, we have our, our own microsite of that. So that's ARIACOVID19info.com and ARIA is O-R-E-A. Um, so that would be where I'd start there. From a Canadian standpoint, I would definitely, uh, we still have one overreaching um, uh, board for Canada, which is the Canadian Real Estate Association, much like NAR. Mm -hmm. And they actually have one uh, unified MLS system still. Okay. So uh, you can uh, go to realtor.ca to check out uh, any of our Canadian market, uh, as well as uh, going to uh, Korea, so CREA.com, um, to find out anything that our Canadian organization is doing. All right, very good. I'd recommend agents that are watching this, you know, know where your feeder markets are, know where your uh, migration markets are is another term we sometimes use within the industry. And if, if Canada is one of your feeder markets, you know, I do recommend you familiarize yourself with the Canadian market with some top agents up there. You maybe attend an event uh, like uh, Realty 2020 had. You guys do that every two years, right? Yeah, it's a biannual conference. So uh, the next one will be in 2022. Uh, and that is actually our uh, ARIA's 100th anniversary as an association. Oh, uh, cool. That'll be held in Toronto. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Well, good. Well, um, any, any, uh, any parting uh, thoughts uh, and before I ask my last question for you? Uh, no, I, I don't know if there was any questions that uh, your audience... Yeah, let me look. Good point. Let me look here. My assistant uh, sends those over to me. Uh, so let me see if we have any right now. I'm not seeing any, but, uh, I got actually two questions for you while I'm looking this up. Yeah, the first absolutely. question would be in your estimate, uh, as, in your opinion, in your professional opinion, Sean, you know, the agents, the teams, the brokerages that will be most successful when things go back to, you know, quote, quote, normal are those that have blank in common. Uh, so fill in that blank with those, you know, those agents, those teams, those brokerages that will be most successful, that will thrive when things go back to normal, so to speak, are those that have blank in common? Yeah, I think, um, I think they would have the ability to adapt. Sorry about that. Oh, you're fine. Uh, the ability to adapt, uh, certainly as, as things move forward uh, and we're facing whatever the new normal is going to be, we're certainly going to have uh, a few years where 
things aren't going to be business as usual. So they're going to need an ability to adapt. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've always taken a, a position in my uh, career of learn before you earn, not fake it till you make it. When it comes to luxury, they'll spot you uh, if you're faking it like a, like a $20 Rolex. So you want to make sure that, uh, you know, you're learning before you earn. So go out there and, and do the work to learn what uh, that affluent buyer is looking for, what that luxury market in your area looks like and how you can position it and, and talk to other luxury agents that are out there um, and, and get some advice from them, you know, maybe outside of your market so that you're not worried about competition uh, issues. But uh, I know I've connected with people all over North America uh, from a luxury standpoint to learn best practices, getting my business going. So I think uh, the key there is just uh, knowledge, service, and uh, the ability to adapt. Uh, great, great recommendations, great insight, adapt, knowledge, grit, um, be able to adapt, right? Change is always going, ongoing. So uh, that, that's great. Now, last one, because I know I've seen some pictures of you on Facebook. You have a beautiful setting working from home. Uh, what recommendations? I call it win at home. You know, again, we've had a lot of uh, similar uh, suggestions, but for those that are still struggling working from home, maybe both significant others are home or the kids now with summer vacation uh, being home the whole time and there's no e-learning. Any words of advice maybe that 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 you are doing that, uh, or maybe somebody that you're friends with that have had success uh, to welcome this this uh, working from home environment? Um, any Any words of advice for anyone, Sean? Yeah, we've actually, uh, at ARIA, we actually hosted a couple of webinars about this and how to work effectively at home and, and make that, that uh, you know, pivot, so to speak. Um, one of them is, it starts early. When you get up in the morning and you're, you're getting ready, get ready for work. You know, as you can see, I'm still wearing a suit and, you know, I, I've lost the tie, of course, but, um, you know, dress for work. Don't, uh, don't go down and work in your pajamas. You know, it, right away, if you get ready, you do your hair, you, you put on your clothes, you feel like you're going to work. Uh, second is have that work environment uh, where you can close a door. Um, so, you know, if you have small children at home, I'm not, I'm not blessed with kids, but if I was, you know, or how I do it with my wife here is, you know, I close the door. We understand when that door is closed, I'm not in the house. I'm, I'm actually at work sure. and I schedule breaks. So I get up, I'll go up, I'll have a coffee with my wife. We'll talk. I'll come back downstairs. I'll close the door and go back to work. And then uh, keeping your schedule and your routine. So if uh, your routine in normal life was to get up, maybe do a little bit of exercise, uh, follow, uh, you know, maybe read a book or do some self-development, then go to work, do some other things, uh, have lunch, come back, you know, work and then quit at, you know, six o'clock at night. If that was your routine, stick to that routine in, in COVID as well. It'll help you adapt back into uh, your work-life balance when you uh, go back to the office. But, uh, you know, it's important to be able to uh, recognize the boundaries between work and home. So often they get blurred and we end up, you know, uh, bringing our laptop up to the couch and then we get distracted by what's going on on TV. And next thing you know, we've lost three hours. So, uh, you know, keeping that work environment, a work environment and your home environment separate, even though you're working at home is vitally important. Yeah, really great advice on, uh, on all those points. I appreciate it. You know, you, you got the you got the uh, collared shirt on. I, I wore a, uh, a shirt today that I had worn previously and I'll, I'll have to show it to you. It says, make somebody's day. I know it's backwards, but make somebody's day. And uh, the, the reason I say that, <laughs> what's that? It's yeah, the right way for us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, make somebody's day. You know, I, I want to leave with that. You know, there's just a lot of tension going on in the States with what happened in Minnesota. And, and uh, you know, we need more love. We need to be more positive. We need to check in on people. We need to build others up. And, and there's just so much divisiveness out there. So, again, uh, be, be, be positive. Be the light in somebody. Uh, you know, build others up. And, um, you know, I think that's a, a good message to end with. Sean, you were awesome. I appreciate it. Um, you know, best of luck. We'll get you a, a copy of this uh, to share if you'd like. And um, for great. those of you that, uh, that are watching, you know, thank you again for watching. Have an awesome weekend. Monday, um, we, we're going to have a special guest on talking about pocket listings and and the do's and don'ts and uh, we have Stefan Swinepool on next Wednesday we have some really powerful guests coming on so same time same place luxury lunch and learn every Monday Wednesday Friday we've been doing them live this is our 22nd episode and uh, starting June 12th we might do some recordings because we're going on the west coast trip but uh, any questions you guys have leave them for Sean leave them for me and we'll get them over to him uh, if anybody wants to get in touch with you what's the best way Sean 
Uh, so president at aria.com or uh, oh, yeah, cool. your channels. President at Aria.com. I mean, whenever you have an email address, it starts with president. I mean, you got your wife's probably brings you down at night, but th that's a pretty uh, impressive email right there. Oh, I appreciate it. I'm also available on any of the social media channels. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you again for having me on, Michael. It was nice to meet you at the reality conference. And I, uh, I look forward to a day when I come and visit you in, uh, in Chicago. We can share a slice of deep dish together deep dish, and, yes. uh, and see each other face to face as opposed to through a screen. Yeah, perfect. Likewise. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody. Take care. Bye now. Bye-bye.